Welcome to the CEC Report. It's June 10th and I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined again today by Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Thanks, Robbie. Okay, in today's report, live export suspension is genocide. Economic emergency. Lyndon LaRouche calls for food price controls. And finally, the Productivity Commission. Bureaucratic industry executioners. So first, live export suspension is genocide. In the past few days, many people in Australia's cattle industry have foreshadowed the strong likelihood of a wave of suicides among cattle producers in Australia as a result of the Gillard government's decision to suspend live cattle exports to Indonesia for the next six months. Um, this, th that such is the impact this decision will have on the industry. We'll get to more of that in a minute, but first, what farmers and Australians have to understand. This decision that's been taken by this government has nothing to do with animal welfare. It is a pretext, and it's a pretext to destroy an important source of food production for Australians and for our neighbours in Asia. Um, meeting our industry trying to meet animal welfare standards that are set by greenies and animal liberationists is like a Jew trying to please Hitler. It's pointless. These animal welfare, these animal liberationists objective is not animal welfare. It is to get rid of any um, uh, animal agriculture entirely, get rid of all live exports to anywhere in the world of any animals, etc. That's their objective. And that's what the, um, uh, the that's the force that the government has uh, responded to, uh, for the public's benefit at least, in terms of shutting this industry down. Um, it's important to have a bit of background. The live export of cattle from Australia initially started as a free trade policy, and as such, it started to undermine Australian processing, and therefore, in principle, wasn't a good thing. But when it comes to free trade, Julia Gillard and the Greens are all pro-free trade. The problem is the cattle producers in Australia who are producing lots of cattle, who have survived the free trade assault, they now rely on it. The way the industry is structured at the moment, they rely on that live export. Stopping it cold like this sends many of those cattle producers possibly to their own homemade gallows. Um, the other fact point is, it's an attack on Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is a big, a country with a big population, but a lot of very, very poor people who, as Bob Catter points out, 80 million go to bed hungry. They are trying to raise their living standards. They, they need a food source to do that. They have come to rely on these live imports of cattle for a big part of their protein. And because they don't have refrigeration, they need this beef slaughtered there so it can be provided to them fresh. Um, that all gets the rug pulled out from under it with this decision. Uh, Craig, you've released an, an important statement today, which was, people can see on our website, that this act is the latest example of Julia Gillard and the Greens implementing the British Crown's orders for genocide. It doesn't get much more transparent than this, does it? No, it doesn't, Robbie. Look, we've talked about it on the past, that this government is a Fabian Society-based government. Julia, Julia Gillard is a member of the Fabian Society. The guy that's been boasting on television that he caused the ruckus and the caucus to get this ban, Calvin Thompson, is a past president of the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society represents a movement coming out of the post-Lincoln uh, period uh, of the United States, where you had... Lincoln defeating the Confederates and a huge burst of optimism around the fact that uh, uh, he promoted policies to develop the United States through the Transcontinental Railroad and so forth. The Fabian Society was created by the British Empire directly to, uh, to shatter, to stop any sort of development for a nation whatsoever. Because isn't it true, one of the things that they explicitly saw was that Lincoln's industry <coughs> and infrastructure policies enabled a, a big jump in population in the United States. That's the heart of the issue because at the 
at the base of this is what we've talked about a lot on this program because it is the governing issue for the world today. It's population reduction. Calvin Thompson wants to keep Australia's population around the 22 million, 26 million mark, I think it is. No more, pop, no more. By, by the year 2050, that's a policy of genocide, right? Gillard has come out with the Sustainable Population Ministry. The intention here is what people have to look at. and have to look at very clearly that this is an intention to stop population, to, to actually genocide is what it is. And the, the very fact that you can just wipe out an entire industry from the stroke of a pen, literally like uh, Ludwig's done, is typical of the meanness of this government. Now what has to be done is simple. We have to have a debt moratorium point blank right now for all family farmers in this country. Regardless of the, the issue, this particular issue with the uh, live export, we need it now in order to preserve our farmers. We've, we've called this before quite a few times this year, but certainly with these, the cattle, um, the family farming cattle operations that are screaming loudest, the thing that all cite is the amount of debt they're carrying which this just smashes them. Yeah, and uh, look, the debt, as you said before, they've, been, they've modelled their industries as best they can around the free tra trade agenda, which is a disaster to start with. But the problem is, they've also, because of the debt, you know, they're in, they're in, they have to go to the banking system. And the banks have these things called material ad uh, adverse event clauses in their contracts. So if you've got a farmer that's come out of drought, like we've had in this country, that's had trouble you know, in the last 10 years, now producing for a live export market, that market's cut off. The bank's going to say, well, I don't know how you can survive. This is a material adverse event. Shut them down. That's intolerable. Because the very policies this government has been promoting has now destroyed the livelihoods and possibly the people from the, the, the mooted increase in uh, suicides. That policy is a killer policy. And it has to stop. We have to have a debt moratorium for all family farmers. So, I mean, this, this policy gets to the heart of the actual political issue for all Australians. This is the meanness of this Fabian Society government. This is population control. This is the British Empire. This is Prince Philip, for example, flexing his ideological muscle through the likes of, um, of the Gillard government. And, and you make a point in the press release that the impact of this would be similar to what um, a friend of Prince Philip's, Sir Frank McFarlane Burnett, who is a very famous Australian scientist from yesteryear, called for in the 40s for biological warfare to be conducted by Australians against countries in to our north, such as Indonesia, where we were going to poison their crops and poison their waterways with biological agents to depopulate them, is what he was advocating to be done. Well, isn't the um, uh, impact of this policy where we just cut them off from a major food source, it's going to have the same effect. Yeah, because look, protein is absolutely essential for the development of the human body. And we don't have enough protein in the world today. So the idea of getting rid of people is to reduce the protein intake. As you said before, Indonesia has a huge population. They need more protein. We can supply that protein. And that's what our, our mission should be, to supply that protein. However, the intention behind this current policy is we don't want people. Um, just on this, we have references on our website to uh, the uh, I I initiatives that people have come up with, such as the deep tropical agricultural practices that can turn the top end of Australia into a very productive place for developing beef, etc. You can look at it on our website. Those are the kind of initiatives that could be the opposite of this kind of uh, you know, genocidal intention. Look that up and get involved in what we have to do to make sure this gets stopped. I think, Robbie, also one last comment I really want to, to say is in terms of this free trade agenda, right? Because if you had a government that wasn't committed to free trade, the policy you would have would, one, would be one of collaboration, right? Instead of having these market for forces dictate what happens in foreign countries, you would go and you would have a government-to-government -government arrangement whereby we would support uh, a vigorous increase in the physical economic infrastructure of those countries. And therefore the trade would be governed government to government. So instead of blaming the very industries that are trying to make a living, right, the government, which is a very good excuse by the government, you have a government that actually goes in and says, okay, we want to create the framework for a decent meat trade, a very good meat trade, which is controlled for the benefit of increasing production in our own country, but also so that we can make sure that we maximise the uh, amount of meat that can, that can go into Indonesia, right? And that's a government-to-government -government issue, 
right? And that's what we don't have in our country. Everything is hands off, let the free market do it, and then when, when things go wrong, you blame the free market. And of course, you have the farmers and the producers that are caught in this who have no, uh, who are trying to exist as family farmers in this system, and they just get absolutely smashed. And we're going to see more and more and more of this as people, you know, put their faith into a free market system when that whole system is disintegrating under a global and financial uh, disintegration of the monetary and financial system. So, I mean, we're getting to the pointy end of the stick here in terms of economic policy, and people really have to wake up and say, okay, well, what are the parties that are supporting this policy? Well, every single major political party supports this policy, except the CEC, and we have the track record. 20 years we've been fighting against this, and now people have to say, well, hang on, if we don't want to survive, if we don't want to starve to death, then they're going to have to su support us. And that's going to be uncomfortable for some people because the very axioms that have allowed this mess to happen with the live trade export is, the, is going to happen in many other industries around Australia. All right, thanks, Craig. When we come back, we're going to discuss the economic emergency and Lyndon LaRouche's call for food price controls. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report. So now we're going to discuss the economic emergency and Lyndon LaRouche's call for food price controls. This week, US physical economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche responded to what is a frenzy, a frenzied binge of speculation in global commodity markets that are driving up food prices to call for price controls on food, which is a, a, a measure usually only resorted to in wartime. There is a food shortage in the world, but the shortage isn't, cannot be the, used as the excuse to literally loot people to death. Every country is affected by this, emphatically including Australia. Um, for the sake of the people, the speculators who are doing this must be stopped, and the most effective way to do it is with the government introducing, using their power to introduce price controls. Now, I'll just quote LaRouche from um, the 7th of June. He said, quote, We're in a situation where the United States in particular and the rest of the world is being driven into hyperinflation in food prices and other prices. There's only one way to deal with this. Don't try to resist rises in prices. Crush them. You go to controls because there's no reason because of a shortage of food to raise the price. And if somebody wants to do that and makes an argument well, you've got to do it because there's a shortage. We've got to make a buck, you know. You say, no, you go to jail is where you go. And we need immediate price controls. This is going back to what Franklin Roosevelt did under appropriate circumstances. That was under wartime conditions, but we're under combat conditions right now in terms of food supply, in terms of the conditions of life out there in the field. Now, that's the end of LaRouche's quote. As well as what Roosevelt did in America and the United States, um, price controls were used in Australia by uh, John Curtin and Ben Chifley during World War II. One of the notable things about Australia's economic performance during World War II is we didn't have wartime inflation, which was quite amazing really, but that was thanks to these price controls. Um, in terms of the speculation, for decades, literally decades, you've had the, the major cartel companies like Cargill, Continental, Bunge, Louis Dreyfus, Archer Daniel Midland, etc. They've used derivative products such as futures and options and they've sucked farmers into using them and the reason they've used them is to foster that they've, they've fostered a volatile grain market where the more volatile it is the more they can maximize their return for themselves and they tell the farmers look you benefit from this because you get price certainty and of course the price certainty is always a, certainly a very low price but that's the argument for the farmers as bad as that situation has been for such a long time, until the recent era of deregulation, that was limited to only the people who were players in the industry, only the actual grain trading companies themselves and the farmers. Under deregulation, that was all opened up to just purely financial speculators to be able to come in and speculate with commodities. They're the ones that have gone nuts on all commodities, food, oil and everything, and have the power with all these kind of exotic derivatives now to drive things through the roof, and that's what they're doing with food. 
Um, they're wreaking havoc on the markets. So Craig, this obviously must be stopped. Do you support LaRouche's call for price controls as the way to do it? Absolutely. It's the only way to do it. What we're dealing with, as you indicated, is a world system that's in a process of disintegration. We've had, as I indicated last week uh, with the illustration of, the, of LaRouche's triple curve, we've had unbridled speculation. But, but that unbridled speculation has collapsed the physical economy. Now, if you go back just for a sec to look at what a, a real economy should look like, a healthy economy, there's only really two actual elements. One is the production of physical goods and services and infrastructure and so forth, right? And if you look at a healthy economy, there's only two curves. You have that first curve, which is the physical production, and it's going, it should always be going up. Accompanied that, you have another curve, which is your financial aggregates or instruments. These are things like you need in the system to, you know, loans and a way of, providing credit for that system. But that's it. Now, in an unhealthy economy like we have now, Mr. LaRouche actually developed the, the, what he called the triple curve function, which I also referred to last, uh, yet last week, which I think is also important to go back to this week, where you had a third curve, which is your monetary curve. Now, this monetary curve, or monetary aggregates as it's called, is made up of all your speculation, your derivatives, right? And this is the speculation in food production right now that's happening big time where you're getting uh, production in the in not just the actual finished end commodities but all the uh, uh, things that go into production like fertilizers and fuel and so forth I mean oil production on the spot market oil speculation on the spot market is a huge multi-trillion dollar uh, part of the global financial uh, speculative bubble so how do you how do you deal with that well first of all you've got to have a glass steagall uh, system in place whereby you actually cut out the speculation you go back to a regulated financial banking system because Glass-Steagall makes a distinction between real financial activity and just purely gambling activity that's right so you you get rid of the monetary curve <laughs> get rid of it yeah. like erase it off the graph go back to the two curves and then you have to say okay we've got to stimulate the physical production of the economy and we have to control it in a, situ in a situation of hyperinflation like we have now. Therefore, you have to have price controls. And, and one of those price controls is parity pricing, where for I agriculture, you particularly say, OK, well, it costs a farmer this amount of money in order to be able to produce a ton of wheat or a sheep or, or beef or whatever. And that includes real profit so that you're not looting the farmer, that there is a margin there to increase the potential physical production of his operation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what's called price controls, which, which LaRouche has called for. During the war, the price controls were very, very important because a lot of the physical goods that you had in the economy were directed to wartime uh, uses. They had to be in order to fight the war. That meant you had a, 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 sh a scarcity of goods for the local consumption. Therefore, that scarcity would, you know, would mean that people could say, well, we could charge a lot more for these goods. So people would, uh, there would be an artificial inflation created within the economy. So therefore, what Chir Curtin and Chifley came in and says we had, and, and Franklin Roosevelt, we have to have price controls to make sure that these prices are kept at a reasonable level for the economy and to get rid of any potential speculation. Now, that's, what, that's actually what happened, and it was continued after the war. We're in a situation today where we have artificial hyperinflation because of the global speculative bubble. Therefore, as we see the collapse of production, we are seeing prices rise. And now is the time, particularly uh, when you see the great disasters that we've had uh, in the United States, food production, which is going to have a flow-on effect with the rest of the world. We've seen the, the production shutdowns here in the Murray-Darling Basin. We've seen the disasters in Queensland with the floods. We've seen the live cattle trade um, shut down, we have to bring in press price controls in order to make sure that there isn't going to be this rampant speculation. So it's, it's a different way of looking at things, but this is what a government should do, a non-free trade government. Yep. All right, thanks Craig. And when we come back, finally we'll discuss the Productivity Commission, Bureaucratic Industry Executioners. Welcome back. And finally, let's talk about the Productivity Commission, Bureaucratic Industry Executioners. 
So, here's the breaking news of this week. Dogs chase cats. Trees grow leaves. Popes are Catholic. And the Productivity Commission has found a carbon price is the best way to combat global warming. So, this is more than a joke. Politics is a charade. Tony Windsor has seized on this Productivity Commission report this week as if it's an important confirmation. When everyone knows, any, anyone who knows anything about politics knows the Productivity Commission was always going to say that. Who is the Productivity Commission? Well, this is a sad story. This is a body that has, that has evolved over the last 40 decades, sorry, four decades, <laughs> from being originally the Tariff Board now, as the Tariff Board, its job was to foster industry in Australia by using tariffs to make sure we had the industries we needed. It then became the Industry Assistance Commission. By the 90s, it had turned into the Industry Commission. They dropped the assistance part out deliberately because by then, assistance was not on the agenda. And then under John Howard, it became the Productivity Commission. And its job as the Productivity Commission has been the executioner for industry after industry in Australia, in league with other outfits such as the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and the National Competition Council. It's been run by the most radical Mont Palomite free marketers around um, with to, to uh, uh, spearhead this idea that Australia should have no protections um, and we should be totally exposed to a free trade world. So. This body is a joke when it comes down to Australia's national interest, Craig. Given its track record over the past um, decades in targeting and destroying key industries, if the Productivity Commission endorses carbon pricing, isn't that enough to prove the carbon tax is intended to destroy what's left of Australia's industries? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you've got a climate in Australia today, which if you had anything to say against the idea, the myth, the fraud that carbon dioxide creates pollution. Yeah. You're branded a heretic. And I have these visions of the Spanish Inquisition, right? And the torture rooms. But you couldn't be burned at the stake because that would produce carbon. Well, so that's, that's the that's, problem. That's your let off. And burning human beings would produce carbon too. So that's, that's a bit of a problem, pro a problem. So when you have these instrumentalities like the ACCs, you know, uh, coming up with these recommendations, you've got to think, well, you know, it's really a government institution, right, yeah. that's sponsored by the government, it's wholly owned by the government, that operates in this political system, which is completely and utterly dominated by this fanatical carbon pollution rubbish. Can it speak out? Of course not. It won't. No government department's going to raise its head. They can't. They can't criticise the policy of the government. And as we've found as a political party that's putting out material all the time and in con consultation with other people that try and speak out, you are regarded literally as a heretic. You, know, you are the... Uh, and it's a religious debate. There's no discussion of the real science, right? Which means the fact that there's even the argument or even the perception that there's no discussion proves there's no science because science itself is the discussion about observations in the universe that create paradoxes. And that's really the strange thing, is that when you, the, the fraud you see is that when the spokesman for the whole carbon debate, whether it be this organisation or Tim Flannery or whoever come out and say the science is settled, you know, this is the best thing for the economy, you know it's a blatant lie because there's no debate. And one thing's for sure, none of this report is going to convince the 75 or 80 percent of Australians who know it's rubbish so that's it for this week's weekly report. Um, as usual, look on our website for the backup material. Make sure you get involved with us. Call us, 1-800-636-432. We are winning this fight, um, but our industry is in our futures at stake. So stay tuned for next week.